Amigos y amigas, bienvenidos a The Great Simplification. Today's guest is Antonio Turiel, who is a physicist at the Institute of Marine Science in Barcelona, Spain, specializing in remote sensing, turbulence, sea surface salinity, water cycle, sea surface temperature, sea surface currents, and chlorophyll concentration. Uh, he is also truly a polymath and a renaissance man. Uh, most times when you see the word polymath, it's someone self-describing themselves on LinkedIn. I am describing Antonio Turiel as a polymath. We talk about oceans, how they are important uh, uh, in regulating Earth's climate, yet they receive very little attention as to what's going on with the ocean temperatures, the AMOC, etc. Antonio also runs uh, a, a popular blog in Europe called The Oil Crash. Um, he truly uh, is working 60 to 80 hour weeks on the human predicament very active in Spain um, on trying to get Spain to do things more sustainably. This conversation covers a wide spectrum of content. Uh, Antonio and I have known of each other's work for 15 years, but this was the very time, first time we've ever spoken together. Uh, it was a great conversation for those of you who are listening to this on the podcast apps. I might suggest that you watch this on YouTube where there are full captions available because Antonio, even though it's his third language, he speaks very, very fast. This was a great episode and I hope to have Antonio back. Please welcome Antonio Turiel. Saludos, amigo. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Antonio, I have known of your work for a very long time, and you've probably known of mine, and uh, we're finally having a conversation. So thank you for, for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule today. Well, I am very glad to be here with you, actually. And yes, I have been following you for very long like now. <laughs> We, we had to wait until the crisis was upon us to have a, a, a conversation, the irony. Um, so you, you are, among many other things, you're a physicist specializing in remote sensing, turbulence, sea surface salinity, water cycle, sea surface temperature, sea surface currents, chlorophyll concentrations, and other marine ocean issues. You also run a popular blog on oil, and you're very active in Spanish, uh, in Spain, in the sustainability discussions, and you have a family and a full-time job. So my first question is, how in the heck do you do all this? <laughs> well, you know, the secret, the secret is not the sleeping. <laughs> it's quite easy, actually. For instance, today I have slept just four hours. This is not my usual schedule, but uh, sometimes it happens. No, well, I think it's a question of having a good organization of time, I guess. But uh, and also, when you are combined set of something, when you, are, you, you think that something must be done, I think that you find the energies to do it. Yeah, I feel the same way, but I still need eight or nine hours of sleep. And you and I on these prep calls with our technology, you were up at 10, 1030 p.m. doing these tech checks. So uh, keep carry on with your important work. So um, I'm, I think we could talk for three or 12 hours, uh, but we have a 90 minute hard stop because of your train. What should we talk about? I think that we can start talking about um, the situation with the climate in general, and in particular, ocean climate, which is my specialty. And then we can go ahead discussing on natural resources and uh, the common that we have uh, for energy and for economy at the global scale. I think this will be more or less the things that we could tackle. Excellent. Uh, that was my idea as well. So I've had a lot of ocean experts uh, on this podcast, uh, one on peak fish, another on <clears throat> prior mass extinctions uh, um, with hydrogen sulfide, um, and, and uh, DJ White, who's a cetacean uh, activist. Um, but no guest so far has unpacked specifically how burning fossil fuels leads to acidifying oceans. 
Can you just for starters in, in like a basic primer sort of way, explain the mechanisms and the risks and implications of ocean acidification? Well, something that happens in the oceans is that the oceans are continually being mixed by the action of wind because wind generates waves, you know? So the question at the end is that uh, because of this mechanism, um, oceans are continuously capturing a small bubbles of air inside it. The question is that if you are increasing the concentration of CO2, this is contributing to the solution of this CO2 inside of the ocean. This is what we call inorganic dissolved CO2. There is another mechanism for the dissolution of CO2 inside water, which is caused by the action of living organisms. So in particular in algae, because uh, when they die, all the, all the um, carbonates, all the uh, chemical substances, they, ha they have assimilated CO2 from, from these bubbles I mentioned before. And when they die, they just go to the bottom of the ocean. And then because several mechanisms, um, the CO2 is also released and also dissolved. And this contributes to acidification, to the acidification of the ocean in the deeper layers of the ocean. So we have a mechanism for the upper layers and a mechanism for the lower layers. And anyway, all of them are contributing to have more dissolved CO2. The CO2, when it is dissolved uh, on water, because it is carbon oxide, um, it becomes um, uh, carbonic acid. And the carbonic acid, as the name implies, it's, it's an acid. So this contributes to the acidification. Why acidification is important? Because uh, uh, there are a lot of marine organisms that need the, um, the pH, the concentration, of ions, the, ac the acidity, let's say, of the water to be in a particular specific margin, otherwise they die. This affects fishes and this affects, for instance, corals, because corals have a problem to integrate carbonate in order to form their skeleton, the exoskeleton. So this, this becomes dissolved, this, they, they tend to disaggregate and disappear. This affects also the, the skeletons of algae at the end, it's affecting all marine life because in one way or the, or the other, they are depending on having an stable, let's say, acidic level in the ocean. So, yes, this is one of the conundrums that we have because also we know that from all the emissions, the man-made emissions of CO2 because of the burning of fossil fuels, we know that two-thirds of them finish into the ocean. So this is the reason why the ocean is acidification at, uh, at this very uh, rapid uh, rate. Okay, I have multiple follow-up questions to that. Let's start with your last one. So most of the heat uh, and um, emissions um, from fossil fuels have been absorbed by the oceans, right? Like something like 90%? What, what, why is that? In the case, yeah, 80% of the case of the heat. Well, the main reason is because uh, the ocean has more capacity to store heat than air. So this is what is called the, um, the heat capacity, which is to say the amount of energy, the amount of heat that you need to accumulate in order to increase the temperature by one degree. And when you compare the heat capacity of the ocean, of the water, against the heat capacity of the air, it's about uh, one million times more <laughs> in the case of water. It's much, much, much larger. So water is the large storage of heat of the air. So anytime that you're putting uh, into contact the warm air with the ocean in a continuous basin, uh, the water is assimilating this heat, is getting rid of this uh, uh, of this heat from the air and accumulating during the water because it has a huge capability to store in it. The problem is that it has a huge capability, but not an infinite capability. So the problem at the end is if we continue to do this, we are going to alter also, what well, alter actually, the structure of the of all the water columns. We are affecting the ecosystems where the fishes live. We are affecting the many, many things, and this is what is happening. And what is more worrisome even is that all this heat that the ocean is accumulating could be released suddenly if the given specific, uh, specific physical processes take place. And this may happen. So one part, a significant part of this accumulated heat could be suddenly released, causing um, a massive disruption. And this is something how, that how, knows, how would that uh, happen? Energy. And has that happened in the past? 
It seems that there are several cycles that favor this release of heat from the ocean. It has mainly to do with the movements, uh, the vertical movements of water in the ocean, and also the difference between the air temperature and the, and the water temperature. So what happens is that as we are accumulating heat on the oceans, if the warm water um, finally um, uh, upwells at a place at which the air is colder than the water, the water will be transferring heat to the air. And this is the main mechanism of transfer. And it seems that this happens with more intensity because this happens always, I mean. Huh? But the question at which times this mechanism intensifies, it, it seems to happen following several cycles. We don't know all of them. But it seems that we have a 20-year cycle that, in fact, we are now going to the bad part of the cycle in which the ocean is releasing a significant greater amount of heat to the air. Uh, and there are other cycles, other periodicities, other times at which it, this uh, release is even increased more. But um, we don't know exactly why um, this happens with this periodicity. We don't know the mechanisms at the end, taking into account, as in any other branch of science, we know some phenomena, but we don't know all the answers of why these things take place. At least we know they take place, but we don't know all the mechanisms being involved. So it's safe to say that most people don't really think much about the ocean unless you live on the coast, but the oceans have been acting as a huge buffer for the heat uh, that we've been emitting over the last hundred years, and we just take it for granted, yes? Yes. Now, something which is important is when you are running climate simulations with large computers, it is very clear that what is driving the behavior of Earth's climate on the long run is the ocean. The ocean is the main driver because it's the main system in terms of accumulating heat and, and, and energy in general. So the effect of the ocean is felt all over the world. And many of the important uh, perturbations, for instance, El Nino, which is something that has been discussed uh, this year, because this year seems that it's probably to be one El Nino year, and it is associated to droughts and, and uh, floods, and it's associated also to heat waves and so on, depending on the place you're living on. Um, this is a mainly, uh, at the starter, is a mainly oceanograph ocean phenomenon. It starts in the ocean, and it finishes on the ocean, actually. So yes, uh, the, the dominant part of all the climate machine is the ocean. So compared to the rest of Earth systems, is the ocean fast or slow to change? And what if oceanic changes begin to speed up? The ocean, because of this huge capacity that it has to store warm uh, heat, let's say, and energy, is the, is the slowest part of the climate system. It's typically, well, not, probably not necessarily the slowest because maybe the cryosphere, the ice, is even slower. But the cryosphere has less uh, size and impact. So from the most active parts, is the slowest one uh, with difference. And the fact that some processes are speeding up, actually, right now in the ocean, is, is quite worrisome, actually, because it is indicating that all the processes uh, around what we typically Called climate, which is what is happening on, on the air, the weather, and so on, probably are going to accelerate as well and much more. So this this is the reason why any accelerating in the ocean is 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 very important because normally it, it is a slow, it should be slow, and actually it is accelerating. Okay, so getting back to your comment on on coral, there are some scientific reports that uh, suggest coral reefs will be 75% gone by 2050 or nearly gone uh, this century. So this, uh, I think, affects like 25 to 30% of ocean species because they depend on them for their life cycles. But this is probably due mostly to sea surface temperatures, um, acidification, will play a role going forward depending on latitude currents uh etc but what what are your thoughts on the implications of a loss of coral and would a loss of coral this century in turn kick off uh, a collapse of of trophic food webs in the ocean well this is clear because coral offers uh, uh, the habitat for many species of fishes in particular so the question is that uh, if coral is collapsing, many species, and especially species of fishes, are collapsing as well because they are going to lose the place at which they live. So this is implying that uh, all this part of the trophic chain 
disappear. Something that people don't take into account is that um, and when you are considering the living, the living uh, beings in, in, on Earth and the different places on Earth, they are all connected. This is the cycle of life. So at the end, you have, uh, you have well, first you have the algae, which is the same as plants in the ocean. There are other animals that eat those, those plants, animals those, those who, which uh, eat uh, those or fishes, or fishes that eat those, and so on, have to arrive to the greatest predators. But at the end, everything dies, and in dying, all the organic and inorganic matter that you have gets dissolved, and is the basis for the new generation of algae to, to bloom. So the and, is and, that I, and and ten million years from now, it will be oil. <laughs> Well, 10 million years, I don't know, but uh, several um, tens of millions of years, yes, of course. Uh, once they accumulate and if the geological conditions are the appropriate ones, for sure this will be turned into oil. Yeah, of course. But the problem is that we cannot wait so for, for so long. <laughs> but the key point here is that if you have one part of this trophic chain, you know, this, this um, trophic means eating, so the way in which one eats from the other and the other eats from this one and so on and so on, and at the end everything is reduced, is decomposed, and serves as uh, as food for um, for the algae. You know, everything restarts. And the problem with this is that if one part of this chain collapses, at the end all the chain collapses. And this is something that, for instance, we have observed in several parts here in the Mediterranean Sea, that we have what is called barren seas. So on, on the barren bottoms of the Mediterranean Sea, we have lost the Posidonia, which is a kind of grass that uh, lies there. We have lost also corals, we have lost a lot of things, uh, we have no fishes. Uh, so the only thing that we have there is orchids, this, uh, you know, this, uh, this small animal. And on top of it, uh, I mean, on the surface of water, you have jellyfish. And this is the only thing that you have. Every, every every other thing has disappeared. So this, this is, is, is that just in actually. some areas of the Mediterranean, or a lot of areas? Uh, it is happening maybe in some um, in some coastal areas across Spain, across Italy, and across Greece. So, are you uh, chained to your office doing papers and presentations in science, or have you actually gone, been able to scuba dive and, and go in to look at some of these reefs and, and actually in the ocean? No, because the problem, you know, <laughs> I have too many things already to be done. No, my problem is that I specialize it a lot in remote sensing, and remote sensing, you see the ocean, but for a, from a distance, you know? <laughs> And even if I travel a lot, because I'm forced to, because I have a lot of meetings, for instance, with the European Space Agency for these kind of things, I am not uh, doing um, campaigns. I am not performing campaigns myself. I, my, my colleagues here are performing. Sometimes they have invited me. But the problem is that you cannot arrive to everything because it's, yeah. it's very hard. It's very hard to do everything. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, I understand that. So acidification is going to affect aragonite and, and calcifying organisms. Um, but it's another hit against coral, but also, as you say, not only coral, but other calcifying plankton and, and organisms. So I assume that this will, because of the heat, uh, and maybe the oxygen, I'm not sure. I assume that this will initially be in the shallow waters, um, but how fast will ocean mixing make this a full ocean thing? This is hard to say because, you know, we have, we're observing that there are, um, we have experienced changes in the way the ocean is mixed. Because something which is quite interesting, actually, it has to do also with the problem of uh, taking profit of wind energy, is that winds are becoming more intense in open ocean and less intense on, uh, on the continents and on coastal areas. And um, some places this, this change has been traumatic. What, why is so, that? Uh, we are not completely sure. We think that it has to do with the most rapid pace of uh, ocean in order to absorb and release heat. Uh, but anyway, it is something that we are measuring. So we know for sure this is happening. And as I said, in some places, this is quite dramatic. So the question is that the wind, wind is the main force for mixing. In the ocean. It's not the only one, but it's the main one for the mixing of waters. So we are changing the way in which uh, uh, waters are mixing. But again, this is not homogeneous. There are some places at the ocean at which the, the, the mixing rate is increased and the mixing rate at other places is decreased. So you are commenting on, on, on temperature, on water temperature. And this is true that this is affecting, uh, in general, all the life. 
because uh, I, well, temperature affects in many in many different ways. One important way is that as you increase the temperature, you are reducing the solvability of oxygen. So it means that the amount of oxygen that is contained inside the water is diminished. So for uh, organisms that rely on having this oxygen to, to live, for instance, fishes, because they are taking the, the oxygen from dissolving water, they have less and less at that, and even at a point that combined by uh, combined with um, the presence of some algae, there are death of the zones in the ocean in which there is no oxygen at all, so no living species lives there. Um, and this is this is one of the effects. For but for sure, the increase in temperature also, what is increasing is the solvability of um, the carbonates in water, and this is also one of the reasons why the the reefs, um, the coral reefs, are suffering, and other organisms are are, are, are struggling um, because the the carbonates, the the, the substance that at the end, the, the carbonate to understand to be understood is. I mean, it's like the, the, the concrete from which the organisms are, are done. So at the end, it are made. So at the end, if you have not this, if this, you get this whole thing water, you have a problem because anything is, is being ruined, is, is being destroyed. So last year, I had a podcast with uh, British Columbia scientist Daniel Pauli, who's um, studying something called the gill oxygen limit theory, that fish are actually moving towards the poles because they have yes. to get... They, they can't breathe. They have to go to where the water is cooler and there's more oxygen. So fish don't care about the climate debate in the world. They're already moving towards the poles. They are moving, actually. And yes, so, I mean, but the question is that at, at this point, trying to deny that there is a change um, you know, on the climate of the Earth is uh, completely absurd because it's something that we can measure from many, many different ways. I, I, I will explain you something that if you don't know, probably you're going to find... Amazing, actually. Some years ago, uh, one friend of mine went to Antarctica, and he commented to me that it was absolutely impressed because he has been a lot of times there um, the, of amount of blue icebergs that he saw. Um, why blue icebergs are so special? Because the ice becomes blue only when it is very, very, very compressed. So typically, when you have um, a blue ice, it means that it has been really um, very deep inside a thick layer of ice, probably for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So these icebergs made of blue ice that he saw probably represented the ice that was there since, I don't know, maybe 20,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, something like that. And now uh, the problem is that everything gets destabilized there. They are running into, into, into the sea. And this is not normal. I mean, prior to that, I mean, 30 years ago, you almost never saw um, one of these blue ice icebergs. But this is one among many, many other evidences <laughs> of the things that are taking place. And in particular, regarding fishes, we are measuring this. We are observing that as decades pass, several species are moving, are moving, uh, uh, going away from the equator. So again, to the North Pole, the South Pole, because otherwise they cannot live. There are some species that simply cannot resist some temperatures, and also for breathing, they need specific conditions. Not only that, but there are some specific um, species of fishes in which the rate of, uh, of the gender changes depending on temperature. So we are observing that because of these changes in temperature, they have, for instance, an excess of female specimens in front of uh, male specimens, and these at the same time might may cause some problems, okay? So there, are, as I say, there are many evidences, and it's not only on the sea. We are also be observing the displacement of some insects. For instance, in Spain, it's quite evident right now, we have some species of insects that uh, used to live in the tropics that are arriving now to Spain, just because the conditions are allowing it. You also have those dedicated um, plantations that show there are trees in Spain, but they're basically dead monocultures that don't have a lot of biodiversity and, and insects and, and life the way that they used to do. There's that. So, so let me ask you this. I don't know if you know much about this, but since we're talking about the oceans and wind, there has been news that the, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Ocean Current has slowed something like 15%, which is a massive amount in the last 30 or 40 years and living in Spain and, and, uh, Northwest Europe that has implications 
for future climate. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the climate models worldwide, that area doesn't look to be heating up that much relative to the rest of the world. Is that because of this AMOC? And what, what can you say about your research and, and, and what the AMOC is and, and the implications? Yes. So the AMOC is what you call Gulf Stream. So it is the, let's say, surface um, um, arm of AMOC. AMOC is a part of the global circulation of water that is essentially transferring heat and moisture from the equator to the poles. So there is one of these arms that goes on the surface, what is called the Gulf Stream. It is running from North Brazil, enter the Gulf of Mexico, then turning around uh, Florida Peninsula, and then following all the East Coast of the United States, and then turning um, more or less uh, a bit below um, um, Cape Hatteras, very close to New York. It is it is uh, turning uh, down to east, and this is arriving. Um, it is follows more or less a constant latitude, so it's like a, say a horizontal state line when you see a map, and this is arriving Europe, and this is supposed to be one of the main reasons uh, for which the climate in Europe is warmer and um, moisture. I mean, we have more humidity thanks to that. And this also hel helps in order to have a better harvest here and so on. So it is very important from the agricultural point of view. So what you say is right. One of the implications of the slowing down of uh, AMOC is that um, uh, the climate in Europe is going to be, by comparison, um, not as warm as the rest of the of the world. I wouldn't say cooler because it's not cooler because the driver for increasing temperatures is also present in Europe. But here the temperature, I mean, in Central Europe is different in the case of Spain. Uh, doesn't increase at the same pace as in the rest of the world because of that, because the lack of this. But also, it becomes drier, and this and this drying part is and worrisome right now. For instance, we have a problem, important droughts in Europe that were unseen since five years ago, like well, five hundred years ago. Uh, it may be a coincidence, or maybe it's an effect uh, of the cumulative effect of the climate change for sure. Okay, three more questions on oceans, and then and then we can move on. Um, number one on AMOC, um, why is it slowing, and how much further slowing is already built in because of the inertia of the climate system? Hmm. Yes, uh, as I have said, AMOC is part of this uh, thermohaline circulation, so it is mainly driven by the difference in temperature and salinity. And um, precisely the thing I am working around this, because now we are able to measure sea surface salinity, we are able to measure um, sea surface temperatures from since some years ago, and also sea surface currents. We're combining all together, we can identify at which um, at which rate um, water subsides and down wells at a specific places. So the question with AMOC is that you need to um, to close the loop associated to the thermohaline current because at the end it might it must make a circulation so what is coming on surface but at the end it needs to go down in the ocean running by the bottom of the ocean then coming up uh, in antarctica or in the pacific ocean and then coming back from several ways and then finally arriving again to Gulf of Mexico and at the end, completing the, the circuit, okay? So the problem that um, is probably the, one of the causes of this slowing down of AMOC is the problem that we are observing in the south of Greenland that was one of the specific places at which, uh, at which this current was subsiding, was done well in. Um, probably it's associated to different things, um, lack of wind for one thing, also the accumulation of fresh water because of the melting of water from Greenland and also from continental Canada. Uh, this is, for instance, something that was observed uh, in, in, past, in past times in the geological story, um, history, that the fact that you have a great, a great amounts of fresh water coming, uh, fresh water is, is harder to, to be sunk. So the problem at the end is that and this, this water normally, what happens normally south of Greenland is the combination of wind and other factors makes that some salt is released and this water is getting uh, saltier and colder and then uh, it is starts to sink and this is the way it completes. But now because of the presence of this fresh water in surface, this warming in surface, it tends to be buoyant. It, it tends to be at the surface, it's very hard to sink. 
and it's one of the reasons it is slowing down. We have other two points at which the AMOC goes down, which are south of um, Iceland. Um, probably th there are also some efforts there, maybe not as intense in the case of Greenland. So this is the reason. The main reason is this one, I mean, because the changes associated to the melting, especially coming from Greenland and, and from Canada. And how much more uh, of that is already built in? Well, you know, as this is a very slow current, when you make a change on it, it takes a lot of time to re <laughs> reinitiate it. Okay, so to for rebooting it is is very hard. Now, the main uh, concern right now is if this current could be completely stopped because of this, or diverted more to the south, that it could also happen. There, there was a uh, Hollywood even, movie about that. I think it was called yeah, The Day well, After that, Tomorrow. I mean, exaggerated. Yeah, I, I yeah. know, I know. But it's, it's very exaggerated, actually, uh, yeah. because the yeah. things are much slower in, in reality. No? But, uh, yeah. yeah, let's say that the, the things that happen several days there typically will happen in several thousand years, actually. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, Anyway, the question is that uh, it could arrive to a complete stop. And if it stops, it means that uh, Europe be will become very dry. Actually, this is what happens. And probably it would imply that the east coast of the United States will become much hotter and warmer, even at latitudes like uh, New York, let's say. Well, well, and among other things, it would eventually then lead to stratified oceans and lots of very bad effects for oceans. Um, so, for so example, and what in particular, are, and for hurricanes. Why? And for hurricanes, because you have a warmer, yes, because uh, you know the main fuel for hurricanes is, is the temperature heat. of sea surface. Mm. Yes. So, as uh, you know, that uh, above 28 degrees Celsius um, of sea surface temperature, you have um, uh, energy to fuel uh, the hurricane, and this will imply that hurricanes could go farther north with all the implications that has. Okay, here's a hard question for you. Um, maybe. Uh, some people, uh, especially with what's going on, uh, not too many countries t too far to the east of you, humans are afraid of uh, that we're headed for a thermonuclear uh, strategic exchange between NATO and Russia. Um, what would the effect of a multi-year nuclear winter have on the oceans and their ecosystems? Have you looked into that? Um, the problem is that um, if we do this, well, apart from the implications, the direct implications from radiation and all the the fallout from the nuclear weapons and so on, that is absolutely devastating. Uh, if you do this, take into account that now the conditions, the, uh, let's say, um, astrophysical conditions of the Earth, astrophysical cycles associated to the slow changes in the nutation and the eccentricity of the orbit of the Sun around the, 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 of the Earth around the Sun. The sun. Uh, Earth is now in a situation in which, if we, it was not for climate change, it would be favored to go to frozen to become in a glacial state because normally what happens, what has happened the last millions of years with this configuration of continental masses, with this configuration of chemical composition of the atmosphere and so on, uh, we typically have periods of, let's say, 110,000 years in which the, the Earth is frozen, it's in glacial state. And we have some metastable states not so longer um, of uh, interglacial, which is temperate, which is the, the period in which we are right now, that typically lasts uh, around 10,000 years. So the truth is that um, climate warming and climate change, uh, the, the fact that we have concentrated CO2 in, in the atmosphere, now it is making impossible that the Earth to be frozen. Okay, so this is the only good effect associated to the, the release of CO2. The problem is that we have gone too far away in this direction. But in case you make a nuclear winter, um, you are forcing the Earth on this classical state because it is, it is what is favored just because the current configuration of the orbit of the Earth. So for sure, the Earth, the Earth probably, well, for sure, more probably the Earth will enter in, uh, let's say, 100,000 years of, of glacial state. And also the 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 blocking out of the sun would kill a lot of the the plankton oh, well, and yeah. yeah it will kill everything I mean no no this is clear I mean uh, you have the um, you have a uh, let's say a, a amount of uh, aerosols and other particles being dispersed in the atmosphere 
that typically lasts for five years in the case of a total nuclear war. I mean, I hope we are not coming to this scenario, actually, but in this case, yes, the, uh, the time for the, all the dust to really start allowing the, having uh, the, the rights of light of the sun to come to the surface will be last typically five years. So in five years, uh, almost everything will be lost. Not everything, huh? but all, almost everything will be lost. So this will be a total, it would, would spell a total disaster for plants and for algae for sure. No, I mean, the mass majority of uh, the life on Earth will be exterminated, this is clear. And then we will fall in this time, 110,000 years of glaciation. Jellyfish and urchins? Mm, yes, some crocoaches, maybe. <laughs> okay, so uh, segueing into your other specialty, and, and by the way, let me pause here. You are truly a polymath. Um, I know that because I've followed your, your writing uh, for a long time, and you have a strong Spanish accent. Um, and I just want to call out uh, and, and respect you that you are able to articulate these incredibly complex scientific topics in Spanish, obviously, but also in English, which is not your language. And it's, it's just deep gratitude for people like you that are just so multi-talented and care about these things. So mucho gracias. Thanks a lot. Also in French, if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> Zuta lore. Okay. Um, so segueing into, to energy. So, so you understand peak oil and other limits to growth. So given that we are now or close to peaking and that oil is the master resource, how worried are you then about the future of life in earth's oceans, given that you know, the, the amount of emissions are likely to go down in the not too distant future. They're not going to go away. They're still going to be a lot, but they're going to be not increasing. So that's question part one. And then part two of all the ocean risks, given your knowledge about energy the depletion, what is the biggest ocean risk that you're, you're worried about? Well, that's, these two are complicated questions, convoluted ones, actually. So from regarding the first one, is that you should take into account that uh, even if uh, we are forced to reduce our uh, oil consumption just because the production of oil starts decreasing, that is a process that is since it is starting by now, um, the rate of, of uh, descent, the, the rate at which the, the production of oil um, decays is not fast enough in order to, um, uh, let's say, uh, spell out the possibility of a um, catastrophic climate change. If we wanted to avoid the worst scenarios of climate change, we should be reducing our, our consumption of fossil fuels in general, not only oil, by, let's say, um, five, eight person per year, excuse me, uh, seven, eight person per year. And this is not the way at which uh, the production of oil is going to decay. Not to, not to say, for instance, coal. Coal is not going to fall so fast. The, so the, the question the, is the that, overall decline rate of legacy wells might be seven percent, but we're going to still drill, and that new drilling is going to offset yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The question is that if we were to stop completely. Oil will be more or less around the rate that we need, but we have still coal and you have still right. gas. So it, it, this is not enough. So this and, is quite and clear. plus plus you can see that if uh, what happened in Germany the last six months that's one of the greenest political environments in the world and they're rebooting old cold towns because of the Russia situation. I suspect it. This is this is a, the, the other question. So what happens in a situation of energy crisis is that you make resort to resources that are worse from the point of view of uh, CO2 emissions. So even if maybe in terms of energy, you are reducing your energy consumption because you are using something which is worse, which is not giving you as much energy as you have before, probably in terms of CO2, you could have an, an, a worsening of the situation. So you will have the worst of two worlds. So you have less energy and more CO2. Well, and probably and, this and is the thing we are going to do. <laughs> I, I sadly, I agree with you. And one part that that's not talked about, by the way, there is not a single integrated assessment model in the IPCC that specifically projects a, a decline in growth. Uh, 
And not only that, there's none that do the nuclear winter scenario in the climate models. And there's also none that include a deforestation as a response to negative economic growth. Because, yeah, the burning of the trees wouldn't be as bad as coal, maybe, but we were losing the sink. What, What if we lose half of our forest sink capacity? Yes, and the question at the end is taking account that in the forest biomass, so you have CO2 that has been stored there with some, um, um, yeah, some changes, some renewal, but has been stored there typically for, for centuries. So at the end, you are releasing CO2 that was accumulated there. Yeah, yeah, this is clear. I mean, but it's not the, only that. I mean, it's also fracking. It's also tar sands. This is the kind of resources that are so bad that they release a lot of CO2 just to obtain a meager amount of energy. So... And the question at the end is that most likely we are going to follow this path. And as you have said, this is exactly what Germany has done. Once the situation has become dire enough, they have started burning more coal. Something which is quite paradoxical the past uh, summer is that in a situation in which we have uh, heat waves in Europe, in Central Europe, I mean, in Germany, France, and so on, uh, and we have droughts, they have problems to carry the coal across the Rhine River just because the level was so low that the boat couldn't pass. <laughs> so, and, and they just wanted the coal to, to pass in order to burn it to aggravate the situation. So, But unfortunately, we are so blinded to the energy question, we are so blinded to the climate question that we are trying to do our best, I mean, as a society, as a community, as a, whatever civilization, in order to to burn more and more disregarding the effort the long term the long term effort so regarding this first question my intuition is that even if co2 emissions are going probably down in the next years to decay just because of depletion is something that we cannot avoid probably the rate of decay is not going to be enough in order to really avoid a, a, a very sharp climate change even a catastrophic uh, climate change this is for one. Regarding to your, to your second question, can you remind me? Because I have forgot. Second question uh, is, you, you're an ocean marine expert. Of all the possible ocean risks, given what you just said about climate, what is the, the biggest risk that you are worried about in the oceans in the, in the next 100 years? Well, we have the problem for sure. I mean, it, it depends if you are thinking about marine life or you are thinking about the importance of oceans for humans. There are many things Both. that are very massive risk. Yeah, this is the problem. There are very many things that are massive risk risk uh, for uh, in both senses. So we have the problem with uh, depletion of fisheries for sure. This is important because by 500 million persons depend on the protein they can get they can get from fishes, and we have a lot of uh, overfish fisheries. This is a problem. We have the serious, very serious problem with the accumulation of plastics which is entering all the traffic chains and, you know, plastic is the main problem that they represent is that when they arrive to our, to our, to our dish is that um, they, uh, they, in, they are what is called endocrine, um, endocrine, endocrine disruptors. disruptors. Uh, Endo- yeah. endocrine, excuse me, endocrine disruptors. So it's altering all your hormonal functions and it's, this is not very good, actually. <laughs> so there, there's two plastic so, problems, right? There's the big chunks of plastic, and then there's the minuscule yeah. ones we can't see that are in the ocean food chain. Yeah, this is the problem. The, even some algae are able to assimilate, so this assimilated in fishes, and it's more and more assimilated in greater predators and so on. So we have the problem with plastics. We have the problem with uh, heavy metals, which are very intense in some, in some oceans and some seas, for instance, in the Mediterranean, the presence of heavy metals is quite important. We have, in general, the releases of dioxins and other um, uh, chemicals, um, um, organic chemicals that have a lot of uh, uh, dangers, represent a lot of dangers for life in general because they are very toxic. Uh, we have the problem of sanitation. One of the problems that we have, for instance, very close to the coast, all over the all over the the earth, but for instance in the Mediterranean, is that as we are experiencing every drought, and all the water table is getting down because also we are ex- overexploiting it, 
and um, then the, the, the sea enters from below the ground. You don't see it, but the sea is entering, and it is salification, mm. this, this part. Yeah. So it is ruining this, this water table. This is not going ever going to be able to, to be used because right. the, the content of salt, the presence of the water. That, so, that's so happening in Bangladesh. so many things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So there are so many, many things that for me it will be hard to say, which is the greatest risk. For me, one of the important risks that for sure the ocean is going to have, at least for the following, I hope, a few years, is the, um, the pressure for exploiting <laughs> natural resources in the sea in order to compensate for the lack of resources on Earth or, or land. <laughs> right. Sea. Right. You mean the undersea mining of nodules of exactly. copper and things uh, like that? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I knew that this conversation would go six hours, so we're going to keep it to 90 minutes per our, our agreement. So let's switch to energy. Uh, again, <laughs> you, you know a lot about this topic. Let's just start here. Can you explain what the second law of thermodynamics tells us about what types of energy we should be using and what types of tasks and how it relates to the ability and the desirability of electrification of our economy? Yeah, well, it's also a very complicated question, actually. Well, let's just start by the beginning, um, the laws of thermodynamics. So we know, everyone knows about the first law of the thermodynamics, so the energy is never destroyed, it's only transformed, so you, are, you cannot win energy nor lose energy, it's only transformed all the time along. Um, uh, this is quite, I understand that for many people this is a bit strange, because what you know is that you are putting gas in your in your car, and at the end of the day you have less gas, so you need to refill. So you are losing energy. But the question is, this energy, which is concentrated, organized energy, is getting disordered. It's been converting heat because something that most people don't know don't know is that uh, doesn't know. Excuse me, is that uh, heat is actually uh, the energy, the kinetic, the kinetic energy associated to the movement of the molecules of the, of the of any body. So what you are doing at the end is you have this orderly movement of your car that by friction, by the fact that it is, um, I mean, passing by other surfaces, by the air and so on, you are losing, you are converting in a disordered movement of, that, of atoms or molecules of any substance. I explain in this because this has a lot of to, a lot to do with the second principle of uh, of thermodynamics. What, uh, when you say when you are applying the the second principle of thermodynamics says that when you are doing any transformation regarding energy, no matter what, you are going to lose a part of the energy in the transformation because it is going to be converted in this disorder movement of the things, and this is what typically we call entropy. So when you are, for instance, converting the energy from your gas in the engine in your car, it, um, even in the process that is taking place in your engine, this process is not 100% efficient, it couldn't be, and one part of the thing is just being dispersed as heat, and you cannot avoid that. So the question is that when you are transforming energy from one type to the other, you are going always to, uh, to pay a toll, an energy toll you are going to lose some part of the energy. And the amount, of energy is going, the amount of energy you are going to lose is larger as the types of energy, the original type of energy and the final type of energy are more different. For instance, if you want, for instance, to have um, um, a water bill, and what you want is to convert the mechanical energy of the, of the flow of the river, and you want to convert this linear movement in a circular movement of the wheel, so this is mechanical to mechanical, this is very efficient, and typically you are going to lose very low amounts of energy because of this. So from all the incidents energy coming to the wheel, probably you are going to take in profit of 90% of even more, which is the most inefficient way, the most, uh, the, the, uh, the kind of transformation for which you pay the largest amount of energy in the transformation, for instance, photovoltaics, because you are converting, uh, a, uh, let's say, solar energy, which is the energy of the photons coming from the sun, that's a light, which is a kind of very ordered, but also very dispersed energy. And because of this uh, specific uh, quantum effect on the atoms, you are able to convert this to electricity. They are very different, they're two very different types of energy. You are taking essentially one of the most disordered types of energy, more dispersed, which is light, and converting to one of the most ordered ones, which is electricity, the efficiency is typically quite low. So 
for typical PV panels installed uh, um, today, I mean, the commercial ones, it is around, the efficiency is around 20, 21 person. On a lab, on a specific conditions, very well devices, uh, uh, PV panels uh, with very expensive materials and so on, maybe you can attain 30, 40, I think the, the largest possible amount, uh, theoretically, is about 50 Cs, but uh, under very, very, very controlled situations, which is not going to happen ever in reality. So this question regarding efficiency is quite important uh, because sometimes when you are making plans for all the transformations of the different types of energy, as we are passing through several steps of transformation, every, every step in plaza lost of energy. So we are getting energy from the sun, which is light on, on electricity on the PV panel. So we are losing around, let's say, 80% in a commercial panel. Then you are taking this electricity. And for instance, you want to convert this to hydrogen because hydrogen is more convenient, let's say, uh, uh, to be stored, to be manipulated. I'm not completely sure because I think it's quite bad, actually. But anyway, so you are going to lose another 50% of this 20 percent that you have gathered so you are losing you are going to to have just 10 percent remaining and maybe this this uh, hydrogen you want to use in, in a car or in a truck and then you need to do other many processes in between you need to compress the hydrogen you need to first reduce the temperature because otherwise it is going to be get very warm but very hot and it could explode and then you are going to take this uh, advantage of this in a in a fuel cell, so you are going to lose incredible amount of energy because of any one of these transformations. So, all the idea regarding um, as, uh, regarding the energy transition, the way in which we are going to apply these different steps, are relying on the fact that at some time we are going to increase the efficiencies, so that everything is going to run smooth and we are not going to lose incredibly huge amounts of energy. But, 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 if, the, but this, if the this, sun this is, is if the sun is so ubiquitous and huge and the photons hitting the earth are abundant, then who cares if it's only 20% efficient on the solar panels? I, I mean, that's right. Well, this is, this is a good point because typically this is the kind of argument that was used for a long amount of years, um, some time ago. So they say, okay, the amount of energy coming every year from the sun equals, let's say, 8,000, 9,000 times the amount of energy being consumed on the earth using all the different sources of energy. So it is so large that who cares? The problem with this is that, uh, first of all, well, let's recall that it is... It, this, uh, this energy arrives dispersed over all the Earth's surface, which is huge, and three, three quarters of the of this uh, surface is, is the ocean. It is not easy to gather the energy there. Other parts are deserts, other parts are mountains. I mean, it's not that easy to gather it. But the question also is that uh, from time, so, since some time ago, we know that um, at the end, the Earth is already using the energy from the sun for doing things which are important. For instance, right. uh, I mean, to, to create winds, uh, rain, to make the, the plants grow, you know, these kind of things that are <laughs> important at the end for the functioning, the normal functioning of the Earth. So at this point, this, this has been analyzed by, at, the, at the Zurich Technology Institute. I arrived to the conclusion that in the best of the cases, the amount of energy that we can intercept from the sun without altering all the normal functioning of the Earth in a catastrophic way, even worse than the climate change, will be uh, to gather around 0. I don't remember the percentage, but it will be equivalent to four times all the energy that we are consuming right now, which is a huge amount, actually. Huh? But it is not eight, 9,000 times, it's just four times. So this first implies that, okay, it is not as abundant as many think. It is abundant, but it is not incredibly now, luxuriously abundant. It's, this is not true. And then, if it is a large amount, but it's not so large, then the way in which you are using it is very important. And the efficiency of all the transformations are crucial if you want to make something which is functional. And this is just one of the many problems that we have with all the systems devoted to gathering um, the gathering renewable energy. Eh? So if you want, I, can, I mean, it's a typical, when I'm making my talks, um, I typically explain 
why this model of renewable energy is not necessarily the best one, the best fitted one. And this is just one of the four main problems that we have with it. So the, the first one is this one. The second one is that it relies on materials that are not so abundant on Earth because the systems for harnessing this energy, maybe the kind of energy they are harnessing is renewable, but they are done from non-renewable materials. And the problem is that some of these materials are actually scarce on Earth. And they have also their own depletion curves, so you can obtain a given rate, so it's not that easy to make the substitution. And, and even the non-rare ones, if we were to scale them, uh, you know, two orders of magnitude, like copper, will will have their own depletion curves, and it will take more exactly. energy to get them. Yeah. Exactly. Well, in fact, in the case of uh, copper, if you see what is happening in Chile right now, mm. it is quite clear that very, you are, we are arriving very close to the peak of copper production. In principle, it was intended to be around uh, 2035, but I think that probably we are going to accelerate it. And, and then if we do mine all that additional copper, then we have another shortage, which is water in Chile, because you need yes. a lot of water to mine the copper. Okay, keep going. What are the third and fourth? Let me let me say something about this, because it is interesting, because uh, some months ago I was contacted by a mining industry in Chile, because they wanted a system to predict the presence of jellyfishes, because they have also a lot of jellyfishes there. Coincidentally, <laughs> and the problem that they have is that they need um, to get, in order to operate a desalinization plant, they need to keep the main duct uh, taking the, the seawater free from jellyfish because it blocks, and every time it blocks it, it makes a breakdown for several million dollars. And they wanted to have a system to predict this. So, you know, everything at the end is, is connected in a way. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I mean, the uh, uh, the late Albert Bartlett said that um, the greatest uh, inability of humans was to understand the exponential function. I would I would append that by uh, the ability of humans to think in systems, to think and then what because we're so reductionist looking at one thing but now we know the jellyfish impact copper impact solar impact energy okay what are the third and fourth uh challenges yes so um the third and this one is quite crucial right now is the so far when you consider all the steps on the life cycle of any renewable gathering system um uh, it depends, I mean, all, it depends on fossil fuels. So for each one of the steps on the life cycle from the extraction, the extraction of the materials that you need in order to make the, the different pieces, the different components of the systems, the energy devoted for this making of these components, all the phases of transportation, all the phases regarding the deployment, the installation, and the maintenance of the systems, and at the end, the decommissioning, if, if any, because sometimes they are not decommissioned. In all those phases, you are using fossil fuels. It's very hard to avoid using fossil fuels. And up to date, nobody has ever gathered, um, uh, managed to, uh, to be able to do all the steps on the life cycle of our renewable system. Uh, in which fossil fuels were not uh, appearing. Uh, so, for instance, this makes people like Gail Berber to say that, in fact, um, renewable systems are fossil fuel standards, something that you can, you can get around if you have some fossil fuels by the hands. Otherwise, you cannot, because they need fossil fuels to operate. And I think this is a quite serious concern right now, because something that we are observing is in the current situation in which, for instance, we are struggling to keep on the level of diesel production, because diesel is the thing that is decreasing the fastest regarding all the, all the fuels derived from, from oil. Um, we are observing that, in general, oil mining uh, on the earth, transportation on the earth, has become much more expensive during the last years. And this is affecting, for instance, companies uh, that are working manufacturing uh, windmills, or manufacturing uh, wind power, turbines and the uh, systems and so on, to the point that they have incredible losses. I was gathering the information quite recently from the losses accumulated during the last year, just the last year. And I see that, for instance, the three greatest um, uh, wind manufacturers uh, on Earth, they have very incredible losses. For instance, Vestas 
has uh, losses for one and a half billion dollars past year, just 2022. And Gamesa, which is now part of Siemens, it was a former Spanish company and is now part of Siemens, uh, they have uh, two billion losses past year. And um, General Electric, the wind power division, they have uh, 2.2 billion losses. So it's absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah, I'm much so, more uh, sanguine about solar than than wind uh, as as a you know potential resource. But but keep going on because I have like 19 more questions for you. So what okay, is the number? Okay. F- what is? And by the way, real quickly on this, I totally agree with you that all the renewable advocates in government and and, and industry kind of neglect the fact that we that they think that uh, we just keep everything the way it is and we build out all this other stuff without understanding that this huge subsidy of uh, fossil helpers, uh, 500 billion strong in terms of of human labor equivalent, are going to be retiring and declining. And that is what is supporting the build out of of renewables right now. But keep going, um, Antonio, what is your fourth? My fourth question is is something (coughs) that I find also quite interesting that nobody wants to discuss all of this. And it's the fact that those systems are um, by design uh, designed to produce electricity. And electricity is, is something which is cool, I think. It's something that is very nice. Uh, it's a high-value um, ki- uh, kind of energy. It's not a source of energy. You need to produce consuming energy. But at the end of the day, in the context of the world, it represents 20, 21% of all the fine energy consumed in the world. And it, in advanced economies, it's, uh, it's a bit more, but it, you are all typically moving on the range of 20-something percent. And the question at the end is you have a 70 something percent of the energy, which is not electricity currently. And we're assuming that it's going to be easy to convert this to electricity usage. And it is not clear because some of the things that we know that are hard to be able to go to, um, to, to become electric. And even more important, interesting than that is that when you analyze the consumption curves of electricity, for instance, in Spain, in the European Union and in the in the ensemble of all advanced economies, we have said that there is a stagnation or decrease of the electricity consumption since the year uh, 2008. So we have 15 years in a row with oscillation. I mean, it's not a simple decline, but you have a, a clear trend of, of decreasing in electricity consumption when the previous years would have a very steep increase of electricity consumption. So it seems that it is very hard to increase the amount of electricity that are consuming. And this is normal because electricity is not the preferred way to consume energy. It's still the preferred way to consume energy because of the flexibility, the, all the, the possibilities that it gives is from fossils derived from, from oil. This is the main source of uh, final energy in the world. And um, when you say, when, for instance, in the case of Spain, that now they are pushing very strongly on also in Europe, that we may just make this substitution because it's going to be simple in some sense. And I say, okay, but at the end, the consumption of electricity is being reduced from 15 years. So it's not something which is accidental the last year, I mean, the COVID the pandemic. No, 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 no. It's something that actually. It's happening for 15 years in a row. So something is happening here. Of course, it has a lot to do with the uh, lack, the, um, the loss of industries in general. The industrial reaction is something that in, in Europe now is getting very intense because of the you know, situation in Europe. And um, it's not easy to say that this is going to change. So why do you want to increase the amount of systems able to produce electricity when you have no actual market for it? This is an interesting question. Well, you and I have never actually spoken about that, but your four, um, your four categories there are exactly what I say in my presentation. So either we're reading each other's work, um, or (laughs) this is a, this is a robust finding. Um, so, um, so you've said before, Antonio, that based on analysis of various studies, that the world would likely be able to sustain around 40% of the current energy that we consume in kind of the intermediate to longish term. You've also said that if planned for and managed well, that this doesn't have to result in a drop of standards of living for most people, but rather a change in lifestyle. Can you unpack what you mean by this and what is the difference between standard of living and lifestyle in your opinion? (sighs) 
I think this is quite be, uh, seen quite differently in Europe than in the United States because here we have not the sur suburban sprawl and it is easier because we need less, um, let's say, uh, private transportation systems. So, for instance, in my case, I live in, uh, in a town outside of Barcelona and I commute by train to my work here in Barcelona and back. Um, well, for me, this is not uh, quite complicated not to have a car, but for the United States is quite complicated. So, the question, for instance, the discussions here in Europe, uh, as you know, um, the European Commission has said that in principle, the selling of cars working on, on gas or diesel could be forbidden uh, starting in 2035. And this is because they, come, they start to realize that it's going to be very hard to, to keep all the amount of, of cars that we have here. So how you can manage to make uh, these changes in the energy consumption without affecting your uh, life standard? So, Maybe not owning a car, but selling a car with other people that are going in the same direction of you. Probably this is much easier to be done in places like Spain or in places like in Europe in general than in the United States because you, you, you live in a quite different way. Okay, We know also that 30% of all the food produced uh, globally is wasted even without anyone touching it. And so the, when we are talking about the problem that we have in the food system, that we have a problem, a serious problem in the global food system. But this problem is mainly a distribution problem. It's not a production problem. I mean, we have also production problem for sure. But the main contributor right now is a distribution problem. We have uh, in the huge waste of, for instance, uh, clothing. There is uh, this, I don't know if you know that in um, Atacama Desert in, 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 desert in, in Chile, uh, there is a vast extent of terrain at which there are a lot of clothing being dropped there. Some, some of them are still wrapping the plastic they were producing. <laughs> so because nobody has ever touched them, just because now are out of fashion and they are not interested. And then, well, this, of course, is a very huge waste of energy, resources, water, whatever you want. Um, and in, in general, in, uh, these um, methods of car sharing, uh, something that, for instance, in Spain is quite common that you have a washing machine inside your house. This is not typical in the United States, but uh, here it's quite common. I mean, the um, blocks of apartments, uh, people has a washing machine um, for its own at, at each apartment. So you can share them, for instance. This is done a lot of uh, in the United States. Uh, you can share them. You can share other um, uh, electric appliances. Uh, I mean, at the end, it's a question of uh, reorganizing the way in which things are done. And in the case of Spain, for instance, it will be relatively easy to reduce uh, our energy consumption by two thirds. But also by two because, thirds? Yes, relatively easy. Really? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but the problem, the problem is that this will have a huge economical impact. Right. And financial on, on stocks and For bonds sure. and things. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the question is, uh, I am just discussing here the technical part. The problem is that, of course, the, the, what it implies in terms of economics and financial is devastating because you are really cutting up, cutting off <laughs> sharp uh, a lot of uh, industrial activities, for sure. The problem at the end is that maybe probably this is going to happen anyway. Also, if you want to, the people to live, they need to have jobs. They need to do something for a living. For a living. So at the end, they need to work in something. So it's not that easy as, okay, we are going to shut up all the factories. I mean, it's not that easy as that. But from the technical point of view, the, what we need to live is not as much as it would seem. The problem is how we pass from this oversized economic system, oversized production systems to something that can be encompassed with the limits of the planet. And this for sure is the hardest part, but it's something that I usually insist in my talks, that typically the problem regarding energy is posed as a question, which is a technical question, and this is the reason why a physicist like myself is asking, well, how we can solve this? And at the end, I say, I mean, from the technical point of view, this is not a real problem. The main problem is a society problem. It's a cultural problem. We need to change the way in which we consume, and we um, make relationships between among each other and with the planet. 
It's a cultural thing, mainly. It's not really a technical question. But I'm pretty sure making such a huge transformation of the economic system is not an easy task. And I understand that many people go desperate when you say that because they say, okay, this is almost, is probably more difficult to do than the trans looking for a magic energy source in capable of doing everything. But, but at least we're now talking about it. I think the Ukraine situation has at least made the words that you just said sound somewhat plausible. Um, so, uh, m moving on to another topic related to what you just said that I know you, uh, have researched and thought about why is the idea, uh, the idea of rationing something that is generally associated with scarcity, something that economics and economic theory, which is supposedly the science of scarcity is not good at thinking about or handling and how have the minimal and temporary rationing systems in Europe, uh, because of the Russia, Ukraine situation been received so far. This is interesting also for many avenues, actually. So, first of all, something that should be said about rationing, of course, rationing implies that you have not enough resources in order to keep the things the same way you were doing previously. So, this meaning that in some sense you have a scarcity, but the question is that the economic theory, of course, is not um, able to cope with rationing by a simple fact. It's because in a standard economic theory you have a principle which is called the infinite substitutability pr uh, principle that says any factor, any production factor can be substituted by another one. The market will be fine the invisible hand of the market will be fine. Except for energy. They get that totally wrong. Well, I think it's not only, the, it, it is not the only case, but it is the probably the main case right now. So, and in, at the end, it, this is just a hypothesis. It's not a law of the nature. It's something that, well, it is hypothesized to be the, the, like that, but it's not true. This is what happened. This is not true. The idea is that in principle, if you uh, put a um, price tag uh, large enough, you are going to, the market is going to find a substitute. Well, at the end, it will be, okay, provided the physical reality allows it, that sometimes is not the case, because for instance, in the case of energy, you have the energy that you have, but even in the case of materials, it happens that you have not really appropriate substitutes. And if it is something that is essential as energy is, then you have a problem for sure. So the, that this is the reason why a standard economic theory does not contemplate rationing. Rationing always is seen as a failure of the market because the market should be able, by definition, to provide a substitute. So if it is not doing this well, because someone is interfering with the market and creating this situation. And this is not true. I mean, this is just because the physical reality with this interference is physics. At the end. <laughs> okay. So at the end, the question is, well, how do you deal with rationing? Rationing at the end implies, okay, you, can, you have not enough for what you were your expectations, because uh, at the end is that, I mean, you are expecting to spend as much in, in all the things you are doing, but you have not enough. So you need to decide how do you, how do you assign this? Um, you, uh, in the case of rationing, uh, you cannot use um, the typical market laws because what is going to happen is that the one who is able to pay the most is the one who is going the largest portion, but sometimes you have some essential activities, let's say, for instance, agriculture, <laughs> food production, food distribution, um, I mean, uh, all the things related to water, uh, so bringing water, to have clean water, drinkable water, I mean, all these things implies a lot of uh, energy and other things, and, well, in general, the um, uh, putting uh, all the essential goods uh, to, to the reach of all the cities. And so those things also, uh, for sure should have uh, a priority in the use of energy. So at the end, the question is that when you're thinking about rationing, um, you, uh, how, the way in which you are rationing is a political decision. I'm pretty sure that it is going to be presented, as it has happened in the case of Europe, as a technical as a technical issue, but it is not. It is always a political issue because it is the idea that you have a how society should work that makes you to decide, okay, how I am going to assign. For instance, you can say, okay, we are going, uh, we are giving to everyone uh, this, uh, the proportional amount of, of things. So you have, let's say, 10% less, so everyone has 10% less, okay? But this is a way of saying that everything is equally important to you, but it is not. Or you say, okay, these activities are more important than others, but then the others that are going to be reduced the most, you are taking a decision on that. And this has to do with your or, or, or ideas, principles, ideology, whatever. 
it's a political thing. And in the case of Europe, what has happened is that, um, uh, of course, we, we have not enough gas for, for all the, the things that we wanted to do. So we have passed by several rounds of rationing in, in Europe, even maybe, well, you, you are probably aware, but it's something that even people in Europe has not been aware of this. But first, we have a rationing of gas. So we were told in the past summer that we should reduce our gas consumption by 15%. In the case of Spain, because it was a bit different, it was just 7%. But later, in September, October, we were told that we will, we will have to reduce electricity consumption by 10%, which is a significant amount. Really. And at the end, we have been able to cope with this. We have been able, I mean, we have met the goals. The two reasons for which we have met the goals, first, in the case um, of this particular winter, is because the winter in Europe this year has not been really cold. It's amazing, eh? because, uh, for instance, in Central Europe, we have observed temperatures with more 15 Celsius above, above the average. I mean, it's, I, I don't know how many Fahrenheit, but just multiply by 1.48. <laughs> but uh, it, it is really, it, it is really, it is really very warm. So this has favored that the typical needs for energy, for heating has been much more reduced during this year. The other thing is that we are experiencing a massive closure of factories, enterprises and industries in Europe. It, at a really massive, massive rate. So I think that people don't want to speak out aloud, but it is exactly what is happening. And for instance, Germany is taking, is taking a great hit with this. So uh, all together has allowed us to significantly reduce duration. But uh, what is interesting is that it has been done almost not taking any specific measure. Because the, the state of measurements were quite weak, quite unconcrete. But at the end, taking account what had happened, that the winter was milk, that the industries are closing. So actually, they have not need uh, to, to implement anything on place. Even so, even so, the European Commission has announced that for the, from here to the year 2030, we should reduce our total consumption of energy another 12%, or total consumption of energy. Taking into account that we are starting from what, where we are starting, then, with this reduction on, on natural gas, with the reduction of electricity. Not only that, but for instance, in the specific case of France, we have, we, they, they, have, they have a real very complicated situation. Uh, the uh, what they call it sovereignty, uh, uh, sovereignty, sovereignty plan. I mean, or austerity plan uh, for energy consumption. They they say that they are going to reduce the total energy consumption by ten percent from now to 2025, so in two years, and they are going to reduce the total energy consumption by forty percent from now to 2050, which is a huge amount. I mean, this for sure is going to imply a huge economic transformation. Uh, at the end, the problem is how are they going to do that? You are following, for instance, the situation in France right now. It, it is quite uh, heated. I mean, they have massive strikes. No, they have I, uh, I just can't imagine. I mean, given your knowledge that the linkage between energy and GDP, if you reduce your energy by 40%, your GDP is going to go down, which what about all the debt, the, the trillions of dollars of debt by the European Central Bank? How is that going to be paid back? That spells the end of the euro and all kinds of other other issues. Um, I, to, to, a, a comment and a question. First of all, the, the fact that European governments are actually stating these things is hard for me to imagine the same statements be made in my country. I just can't not imagine it, even though but, you're at least facing reality. Well, but the, we have we are facing a different reality than yours. That's true because uh, we still have eighty percent of our own uh, energy. Yeah. Yes, this is the key point. You have resources, we have not. Yeah. <laughs> this is the. So do you I think? Mean, do you think? Um, in the near future, in the next decade, that we, Europe and the U.S., uh, or anywhere globally, are are going to need to, um, as part of this rationing discussion, are we going to nationalize essential industries such as energy to ensure that everyone who needs access to resources get the gets them? Is that is that on the horizon? Well, it's not in the horizon. It's already happening in the case of Europe. I mean. 
France has nationalized the, well, they have a, a part which was um, non nationalized, which, which is private, of the main electricity utility that they have in the country, Electricité de France. So 16% of this was in private hands, and they decided to nationalize by year. But at the same time, Germany uh, decided to nationalize the three largest um, distributors of natural gas in, in, in Germany. But at the same time, Belgium privatized the electricity utility of Brussels. At the same time, Austria privatized the, same, the main utility on Vienna. I mean, this is happening all over Europe. But it is being done in such a, I don't know how to qualify this, but let's say silent way <laughs> that nobody is actually talking about this. And for me, this is very funny because um, um, the European Union has specific regulations against that, against doing exactly that. But as all the countries are doing, nobody is saying anything. It, it is quite funny. So it is already happening. But probably this is not enough because the key point for us is that we have not the resources. We have not the resources. So we need to get the resources from somewhere. In the case of the United States, you have resources. You have plenty of resources. I mean, they are not infinite. You are going to run out of them. You are going to, uh, and be, uh, before that, you are, you are going to run low on them. Maybe the, the amount of uh, resources is going to be depleted. And this is going to cause problems there. But it's not the same as in Europe. We have really so, nothing. So, so I wonder who's going to be better off. Spain, because we don't have the resources and you're going to be faced with a hardship now and figure out how to navigate it at a lower throughput or the United States, which has another decade or two of resources and will continue to living in an unsustainable way and not prepare. Well, uh you know, this, there is a sentence by John, Mal John Michael Greer, which is quite good. So collapse now and avoid the rest. Yeah. <laughs> so I think maybe this is going to be good for us, even if it is going to be harder right now. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. So many people, uh, Antonio, um, moralize capitalism as either a savior of the world or the root of all our problems. What is your stance on this? And given energy depletion that uh, and climate and ocean risk, which you are fluent in, do you see capitalism ha as having a place in future societies? Well, I need that we need to... Um to go to the next step. I mean, capitalism is just one step in the evolution of economical thinking. So we have, before that, we have what is called, I don't know how to say in English, sorry, I know the term in the Spanish, but we have uh, what is called, called physiocracy, then, well, another term that I know how to translate. So we have passed by several different economic systems. Capitalism, as we understand it now, uh, you typically, when you look for a definition, for instance, at the Wikipedia or whatever, you say capitalism is a system which is characterized by private property, free market, and so on. And this is this is right. I mean, in capitalism, you have that, but you have also in other systems, in previous systems, we have also uh, private property and free market. This is not what makes the essence of capitalism. What makes the essence of capitalism right now, I mean, at the beginning of 21st century, and the thing that in fact puts everything in compromise is the necessity of, of growth. This is the key point. So the question that the capital, um, the money, uh, uh, has right to, to have an interest rate. So this interest rate is what makes you, uh, makes the need for this exponential increase on wealth, this exponential increase on production and consumption and everything. And for sure, this is completely incompatible with a finite planet. <laughs> this is the, the key point at the end. So we need to overcome the limitations of the current system and to go to a different system, which is just another one in a section, historical uh, succession of systems in which you can have private property, you can have free market, but you cannot have infinite growth because, of course, infinite growth is impossible in a finite planet. This is the key point. So uh, some people, when I am discussing this thing, some people here in, in Europe, you know, in Europe, the political thinking is different than the United States, but they, they, they like to pose themselves as anti-capitalism. I, I think that this is, uh, from my point of view, a wrong a wrong way to, to post the thing. It's not a question of going against because capitalism with these uh, lights and shadows is just, a, a, for me, it's just a, a, a step in the evolution. 
So the question is not going to be anti-capitalist, but be post-capitalist. It's going to a system that is going to be created after this one. And this is something which is natural. I mean, all living things, as civilizations, for instance, progress, change uh, along the time to adapt to the situation. So we need to adapt to the current situation. And this adaptation implies an evolution in our way in which we relate with each other and also with the planet. And something that should be, have been obvious from several decades now, but now it's impossible to, to avoid it, is that we cannot grow forever in a finite planet. I mean, it's so simple a statement, very very clear statement. All the, uh, the statement, all the plans that we have is from one, uh, on one hand, we have run with the inputs because we cannot keep the pace, the rhythm at which inputs are entering the system. We are not running out, we are running short. So, and you have a problem with the inputs, and we have a problem with the outputs, because all the ways we are generating are changing the climate, but are contaminating ourselves. I mean, it's poisoning ourselves at the end. So, uh, at the end, and all these things, because we have, uh, we have had the intent of growing forever in a fifth planet, and this for sure cannot work. And this for sure should, at one point or other, should break at some place. It is breaking at several places at the same time. Okay. It doesn't matter. We have a right to this point. As I used to say, that I am not looking for, um, how do you say? Ah, sorry. I, 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 I am not interested in, in, in finding the guilty persons. I'm interested in finding the solutions. So forget about how we are here. It doesn't, it doesn't imply for, that for sure people, some people have more responsibility than others. But for the time being, the chat's concentrating on the solutions, which is the thing that we need. And as you have said, um, we are going to run probably very different pathways. For instance, in Spain, in Europe, in the United States, in China, in Russia, the situation is going to be quite different for the different regions and so on. But in the long run, we need all of us to become really sustainable in some sense. So Europe, for me, is already <laughs> in, the, in the fast track to that. And we need to figure out how to do this in the easiest way. And the problem from, from now is that they are completely blind to the real, to the real um, depth of the problems that we have. Yes, I see. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I'm not getting to all the questions I want to ask you. So you might have to come back, uh, in six months or so. So, uh, in six months, we, we may live in a totally different world. So, um, Antonio society and the planet, uh, as you're well aware, face many risks and challenges. Um, what are you most worried about now? Like in the near term? Well, for sure, the risk of nuclear war cannot be um, ruled out, unfortunately. I don't, for me, this is not the main scenario, but unfortunately, it's an scenario that cannot be ruled out. And this, for sure, will be overwhelmingly the, the main risk. But putting this apart, for me, the main problem is that probably we're going to observe a proliferation of wars and revolts on the, on the I mean, it is already happening. The problem is that this is already happening. We have many countries that are becoming failed states, failed states. For instance, Sri Lanka is only keeping more or less in safe because India is investing a lot, because India is very worried about the situation of Sri Lanka, also because they have this Tamil minority there that can be influenced by what's happening in Sri Lanka. And India is injecting a lot of resources on Sri Lanka just to keep the, it afloat. But Sri Lanka is completely collapsed. We have Pakistan, which is a country which is also in a very delicate situation, and we are talking about a country having uh, 220 million persons and atomic bombs. <laughs> so this country that should and, be taken and, and they can't buy natural gas because Europeans are buying it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely correct. We have a dire situation now in South Africa, which is in principle the richest country in all Africa at least in terms of GDP, for sure. No? And they have a very delicate situation right now, a lot of instability and so on. But we have many, many countries having quite dire situations in Africa, Latin America, uh, I mean, uh, Asia, at this moment, at this exact moment. So the main risk right now is that we can observe a real breakdown of a lot of conflicts inside the countries, among the different countries, wars, and, and all this kind of stuff. We can go uh, to a global disestabilization process. And this, in turn, 
could severely affect also United States because United States, some of the resources they are obtaining, you are obtaining from other countries. And if these countries get very destabilized, this is going to create problems also for you, even if you can run much more self-sufficient than, than us, for sure. For me, this is the main risk right now. I mean, in the social terms, because this can be, the question for me is that, um, the reason why I think this is the, the worst uh, risk right now is because probably this is going to claim uh, at all in terms of human lives, which is going to be available. So um, do you have any personal advice to listeners who understand what you're talking about at this time of global economic crisis? Kind of the John Michael Greer uh, variations, simplify first and beat the rush? Or what, what, did, what do you tell people? Yeah, mm, I, I, again, it's different in the United States and in Europe. So in Europe... The people, mm, people listen to this podcast in all countries of the world. It's a global audience. The, pro the problem is that probably the response depends on the place you are living in. For instance, if you live in Latin America, nobody needs to spend you because probably you are living this uh, slit, uh, maybe a slow motion or not uh, as a slow motion as you would like. So they already know. The situation is becoming very dire in many parts in Latin America. In the case of Europe, I think that, yes, so simplifying your lifestyle is something which is important. And also to gain, something which is important, very important, is to gain psychological resilience. Because if you have a life expectation, you have a, you know, a lot of expectations of how the things should roll out, and now all your worldview is being shattered by the reality, this is very hard. This is really very, very hard. So I think that um, it's quite important to gain this psychological resilience, to gain this adaptability that here in Europe you are not so used as in the United States. People tend to have a, 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 a lifelong work here. This is the, the usual thing. So people work in the same thing for all their lives, at the same place, everything, all the same. Um, probably now the, scene, the thing is going to be quite different, so we need to adapt and we need to face this with uh, uh, an appropriate dose of optimism, understanding that we can improve, but we need to put the means to improve. This is completely different from the American mentality. I mean, it's, it's a different, completely, completely different way of thinking things. And in Europe, I, I think these are things which are important. Also trying not to get debt because in uh, service in debt is, yeah, yeah. This is going to be very hard. I am very, I am very happy because just yesterday I canceled my, my, the loan on my house. I am very happy right now. <laughs> and uh, I think that this, this other part is important. And also trying to work locally to gain resilience at community level, working community, are things that are important. So in the case of the States, I think that these prescriptions are useful anyway. The problem is that it's not going to be so evident in probably 10 years. During the next 10 years, probably you are going to be in a completely different situation because also you are going to lose our, let's say, dead weight, the dead weight of Europe because Europe is going to get, in some sense, disconnected. And this will allow you, uh, with all your own means, probably to be more or less okay, more or less in a world that has become smaller suddenly for maybe 10 years more. It, it is going to depend on a lot of factors that uh, for me it's very hard to, to evaluate precisely, for instance, how the situation with oil production is going to keep in the United States, because even if we know that uh, fracking as it is uh, going right now with this decrease of the drill and compete the wells and so on, probably is going to, to get a severe drop in the next months. But at the end, it depends if you restart a new cycle of investment, the involvement of the government, because you have the resources at the end. So even if they are expensive, you can exploit it. So this would imply that maybe you are reducing uh, social welfare in order to, to, to produce this thing. Okay, this is going to be hard to, to, to be sure how Saudi is going to be deployed in the United States. But most likely you have, for saying something, 10 years more to adapt. So taking drastic measurements right now probably is going to be uh, seen as a weirdness, <laughs> something which is not fit for normal social standards. But something that could be useful for you is to observe what happens in Europe and to try to learn the lessons from what is going to happen to us. 
Would you change your advice on what to do to young humans, teenagers, or college-age students? What What do you tell them about the future, Antonio? <sighs> well, I have my own teenagers at home, so... <laughs> um, do they understand well, all this about the energy yes, and climate? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yes. My daughter usually says that we have a skewed up all the situation. <laughs> she, she blames us. Well, I, in fact, I, I need to accept that it is true. Actually, I mean, she's also she's also participating in the in the in the same part right now. I mean, because it, it, you cannot avoid it. Okay, but yeah, this is true that we need to do more than on that. My recommendation for people who are for the youngsters. Well, I think that um, even in the United States, the life they are going to live is very different from the one that their parents have lived, and this is clear. They need to understand that getting resilient, to be adaptable, to not be, not be very dependent on um, supply chains uh, that need to arrive to isolated places, this, uh, this is important. We need to avoid that. You, it is better to love in communities which are more or less self-sufficient that can be um, supplied easily, uh, this kind of stuff. And also regarding the choices for career, for instance, if you are going to college or whatever, I think that uh, it is better, my, I cannot avoid that because I am a physicist myself, but I think, I think that in general STEMs, are better choices than others. Unfortunately, I mean, taking into account the, the, the dynamics of the predicament that we have. So if you could go for STEMs, I think it's preferable sincerely taking into account. If you could, I mean, not, not, not anyone has the skills or the natural inclination to this, and also other, other, other skills are useful, huh, for sure. But uh, STEMs are going to be <laughs> massively, massively needed. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, what do you care most about in the world, Antonio? My my kids, no doubt. No, no. I mean, uh, sometimes uh, there are always people that because as I make a lot of inconvenient statements, some people look for some hidden motivation in myself and looking for some I don't know economic motivation, but it's very hard. No? I've been sometimes blamed for working for fossil, fossil fuel industry, oil industry, nuclear, uh, I don't know, whatever. Um, and I always give the same answer when I ask my, my motivation. I have two motivations in my life. And, well, one is 16 years old, some the other is 12 years old. These are my real motivations. And this is the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. If you could wave a magic wand and there was no personal recourse to your decision, what is one thing you would do to improve human and planetary futures? And since you are a polymath, I will give you up to three things with the magic wand. <laughs> I actually would just need one. Okay. One, because the problem is, as I have said, it's a culture. We will have, we will need uh, um, how do you say uh, uh, a collective um, a collective attack of common sense <laughs> this is what we need the most we need to have a lot of common sense that we are actually lacking of it we are putting short term interests completely skewed views of the world and something that for me is quite annoying actually is, is disturbing that many times you observe that people are um, are giving up on their personal responsibility on the public affairs. So you need to get involved. And this, this concerns you. And you cannot say the typical saying that is, okay, well, someone is taking care. Someone is in charge. In charge. This is what kids say. Adults take care of their own business. Adults know that they need to take responsibility. We cannot act as children. We need to act as adults. So if we all act as adults, I think that it will be enough. With education, though, to understand our biophysical reality uh, as, a, as a key component, are you active politically yeah, sure. in, in, in Spain uh, with sustainability issues and, and getting these ideas scaled so that common sense has a better chance of, of manifesting? 
Well, you know, uh, when you say political, sometimes uh, it is important. I don't know if the connotation is the same in, in the case of, of the United States, but um, it's different to distinguish between political and partisan. So, of course, everything what I do is political, because uh, by definition, no, political comes from the word, the Greek word polis, which means city. And it's the things that are interesting for the citizens. So for sure, what I'm discussing is important for the citizenship. So uh, something, for, by the way, if you don't know, the word idiot uh, uh, was applied in the, it's also a Greek one, and it was applied for the people that were not aware about the, the, the uh, affairs of the city. <laughs> so the people that really? didn't want, yes, the word idiot is coming from that, it's a, it's a Greek word. So it's quite so, funny. So should we, should we title this episode Antonio Turiel, Common Sense versus Idiots? Exactly. <laughs> this is exactly this thing. <laughs> so, but anyway, regarding my engagement with uh, public authorities, administration, and so on, I actively trying to convince them. I am talking to them frequently. Some they are frequently asking me requesting me. It is very funny because uh, they don't really trust everything what I say, but they fear that I am right. <laughs> so, and this for this reason they keep on coming and asking me, asking me, even if they don't like what I say, because of course what I am saying is not what they like to put. Yeah. Excellent. So I, I want to keep my word to you so you can catch your train to get back to your children. A final question. This was an introductory overview of your expertise, your work, your worldview on, on the climate, ocean, a uh, little bit on energy. If you were to come back on this podcast six months from now or something, what is one question, one topic that you feel passionate about that speaks loudly to you that you would like to take a deep dive in? Just speculate. Mm, the real energy transition that we need to do. I mean, there are many things that we need to discuss on, on that. But something that probably we are going to be in urgent need, a massive need to be discussed in six months from now, is about food. Because food is going to become a very big issue globally. So probably, see, we will discuss again in six months from now, we are going to talk about food a lot. Okay, it's a deal. Mucho, mucho gracias, mi amigo. Thank you so much for your time and, uh, and, and your work. And let's stay in touch and let me know if I can help you, Antonio. Thanks a lot. You are doing, you are doing enough. Thanks a lot for giving me voice. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases. 